You are listening to The Big Scuba. This is an audio only episode. Aloha, I'm Keller Laros, the Manta Man and Dolphin Rescuer. Come join us on The Big Scuba Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Big Scuba Podcast. Uh, Welcome to episode XXIX, I believe, in Roman numerals. There we go. Episode 29. Well done. Good spot. Um, So if um, this is your first time, welcome. Uh, There's 28 episodes before this one to catch up on. So, um, you know, hope you enjoy. Coming up on episode 29, Gemma, we've got... Keller and Janice from Manta Pacific. Yes, that's right. And uh, really great chat that we had with um, with the guys, uh, full of energy. And it's really great to hear about these mantas. Yeah, yeah. And also Keller and the amazing number of dives he's done, 13,000 and something. And, and they're all lost. He always dives. Yeah. yeah. Which is, uh, there's not many people you can say um, that we spoke to who still log all their dives. You know, still doing all this. Sort of I know, things. but for a new diver, it makes me think I need to log all my dives. You do, you do, and I need to carry on as well. You do, so, yeah. It's uh, quite inspirational to hear a guy who's done that many dives and still logging in and still record, still recording them, and still get excited about diving. You know, yeah, even though it's the same dive that he's done in done day in day out, every day is new. In fact, it reminds me of something else you said to us. Not that long ago. Got to find that magic. And yeah, he's dive. finding his magic every day. For sure. <laughs> so there you go. It's very true. His words come around again. Anyway, it's enough of us running on. These have got more uh, fun and exciting things to tell us. So with no further ado, Gemma, let's crack on and listen to what they've got to tell us about these mantas. Yeah, Manta Pacific. Manta Pacific, Janice and Keller. Hello. 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 <laughs> hey. Hey, good to see you, Keller. Hey, Jan. Hi. Hey, hi Jan. There. Hello, hi. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Yes, yeah, and you, Janice. And you. So, whereabouts are you based? You're in different time zones, aren't you? We all are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm in, uh, uh, in uh, Washington State, uh, north of Seattle. I'm in Kailua Kona, Hawaii, the west side of the big island of Hawaii. So, you know, welcome to the uh, Big Scuba podcast. Go ahead, Keller, you go first. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll go next. Um, I'm a PADI Master Scuba Diver Trainer. Became a, a, a PADI instructor in 1985. Um, worked at Jack's Diving Locker since 1991. Uh, that's where I met Jan. She also worked at Jack's back in the day. Uh, in 1993, uh, my wife and I, Wendy, uh, who was just my girlfriend at that time, authored the PADI Manta Ray Specialty Diver uh, class. We started teaching that at Jack's and uh, we started doing our Manta Ray night dives uh, pretty regularly in about 91 and you know we had like one or two boats a night and uh, I, I did my last one last Friday and we had uh, with, even with COVID we had three boats and seven Manta Rays um, but it's been a really long uh, adventure in terms of the whole Manta Ray experience. It started for me in 1985 when I did my first Manta Ray night dive with the family. I was just out of college, and I was already a paddy diver. Uh, actually, I was a Naui diver then. And after I seen my first man ray, I just decided I want to be a scuba instructor, and I moved to Hawaii, and I've been here ever since. Uh, yesterday, I logged my 13,272nd dive. So. <laughs> Bit catching up today, then, I think. Well, yeah. Yeah. And thank you for still logging your dives, Keller. You got it, Dan. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, it's great to hear people log their dives still, because we've heard some people don't, but then you're on that fantastic number and you're still logging them. Well, yeah, um, when I, I got certified NAWI back when I was in college, and back then there was there was no logging dives. It was up in the Northwest, too, in the Hood Canal, Jan. And um, then I came over to Hawaii in 84, summer, spring break, uh, summer vacation with the family, and I went diving with Jeff at Jack's Diving Locker, and he's captain and instructor, and he's logging his dive. I said, what are you doing? said, I'm logging my dive. I said, wow, that's so cool. What are you keeping your log- logging? He goes, well, you know, things I saw, how much weight I had, you know, how long I was down, all that kind of cool stuff. So I said, where do I get a log book? And he said, at Jack's Diving Locker. So I went in there and uh, they sold these back then, uh, the Scuba Pro plastic 
age logbooks were uh, kind of light blue. So I bought one. I started logging my dives. Uh, I work with Jeff all the time. He's got over 16,000 log dives. Um, so I'm still kind of a neophyte in that respect. Uh, but yeah, log your dives. There's so, so many cool things. You know, we've taken so many cool people diving and seen so many amazing things. And to be able to look back and see, you know, exactly what you, you saw, what you did. You know, I got yeah. Jerry Garcia's autograph in my logbook because uh, the Grateful Dead used to dive with us. And uh, there's all kinds of cool things you can say in a logbook. I mean, don't, don't, don't underestimate the power of it. And I write mine down because my logbooks, I've got logbooks that are 35 years old. I do not have a single piece of technology that's lasted that long. So people say, oh, I put it on my computer. Yeah, yeah, right, Ian? It's like, I don't have a hard drive that's 10 years old, but I got logbooks that are 35 years old. Well, I, um, getting certified was uh, always on my list of things to do. So um, I actually was going to a wedding in Australia. And before I went, I said, I'm not going all the way to Australia without being certified. So um, at the time I was living in California, and got um, certified in uh, Monterey, which is one of those places where, you know, people just pile through and it's cold water, cold water diving. And so got certified, did the wedding in um, Australia and went to the Great Barrier Reef, some of my first dives. So, um, and then um, got the bug and uh, eventually we moved to Hawaii and um, uh both my husband and myself started working at Jack's Diving Locker and, uh, you know, uh, did some traveling, piled on the dives, and um, we moved uh, away from Hawaii probably, uh, well, it would be 12 years ago uh, now. And um, I'm not diving as much now because I'm back to cold water diving and I'm kind of a wuss, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I was really into cold water diving and now I'm not. So, <laughs> um, but I'm also um, really biased uh, about uh, logging dives because that's what I do now is we write scuba diving applications, one of which is a logbook app. So I'm very happy when people log their dives. Back in uh, 93, you know, people were asking us questions about manta rays. And so we cobbled together a whole bunch of information about manta rays but never really thought about writing a class. And then uh, somebody came in and, you know, we're checking their, their certification card as they're checking in to go diving. And it says, it's Patty, underwater wedding distinctive specialty. And I said, what? what? <laughs> said, yeah. yeah, yeah, we got married in Key West. And down there, they have everyone who's going to be underwater on the wedding take this distinctive specialty on how to do And we've done plenty of underwater weddings without the specialty. And I thought, man, if you can have underwater wedding specialty, we did a Discover Scuba Diving one time with a guy called Tony Robbins Group, and he does these motivational training seminars and stuff. And they had, um, it was put together with another dive shop in town, and they're having their big trainers meeting in Hawaii, literally with, you know, like 400 of these trainers who then go and train the other people. And so they all showed up on the pier, and they don't know where they're going or what they're doing. They just know every time they do this, uh, this training seminar, they do something crazy. And so 300 people unload from these uh, buses on the pier in Kona, and they've got all the boats, all the dive boats in town. And we, they say, all right, everyone get in a circle. And they get in a circle, and they say, today, we're going to take you all scuba diving. And everyone's like, yeah. And they say, all right, everyone that's afraid to go scuba diving, step into the center of the circle. And probably like half of them step into the center of the circle. And <laughs> me, he goes, that's your group. And I'm like, no. Oh. <laughs> Some of them had been diving before, but dang, if we didn't, we just got them all through the DSD. We had the swimming pool right there. And we just got them through the, the knowledge review, the flip chart, the skills in the, the swimming pool. We put everyone in their groups. They all got on their boats. And like 20 boats went out. We dropped all these people in the water and literally 300 people doing a Discover Scuba all at once. It was unreal. That must be like chaos. <laughs> it was like herding cats, Gemma. It was <laughs> And like, you know, the, a lot of people are just totally game, right? But some people, you know, like they get in the water and immediately start panicking and you can see him climbing up the side of the boat and the lady's got her hands <laughs> on the freeboard and she says, I'm not too comfortable with this. And she pulls herself up with the scuba gear on her back. We're like, oh my gosh, you know, so like, I forget the name of the gal that organized it, Brico Adventures, but she said, all right, she, she took all the really nervous people, but got them all down, not one single person bailed. So it was pretty uh, cool. Uh, I walked away from it with a... Uh, capturing the magic you know yeah so tell us about your project your manta pacific um well so like i said we started our uh our manta ray diver class in 1993 
And we've been studying manta rays really early on. We discovered that you could identify each individual manta ray by the spots on their chest. And uh, back in the early days, back probably before you were born, Gemma, we had this thing called film. And what you would do is you'd take a photograph underwater. You know, it's a slight sense of emulsion. And, and every now and again, out of 36 chances, you would get a good photograph. Uh, and I got a picture of a manta ray that we called Lefty. Everyone just called her Lefty because the left cephalic fin on her face folds up in front of her face. And I just called her Lefty, and I noticed that her spots were uniquely different from every other manta ray. We had another one we called W. So I literally started gluing pictures into a scrapbook, you know, Lefty, W. And uh, it was really hard with film because, like I say, you got 36 exposures. You know, maybe you get one or two good pictures. Uh, but we started this database of uh, knowing the manta rays, and as we cobbled together the information, started teaching the class, uh, we, you know, we're really enthusiastic about it. And then we had this uh, gentleman. Oh gosh, what was his right before New Year's? 2001 maybe or 2000 and he said um driving down to the pier to do the mandarin night time he said how much money do you need for your mandarin research i said well what do you mean and he said you know ten thousand hundred thousand you know what do you need for your research i said how no one's ever asked me that before and he said well you're a 501c or a nonprofit, right and i said no but i'll become one and uh turns out you know it takes a long time to become a 501c so what we did was we directed him to our friend Tim Clark, who had worked at Jack's Diving Locker and had done his uh, uh, under uh, pardon me did his undergrad at University of Hawaii, did his master's on manta rays at Texas A&M, and then he did his PhD. Uh, he was getting ready to do his PhD at University of Hawaii on manta rays, and I directed this guy John to Tim, and so he was able to write a check to UH, and Tim began his PhD fully funded. But the great thing is John gave me the kick in the butt to get us to go and found the Manta Pacific Research Foundation, and so. You know, all the paperwork that goes for that. Uh, we became a nonprofit of 501c3 in 2002, dedicated to research, education, and conservation concerning manta rays. Uh, Jan was one of very early board members, and she's very computer savvy and an avid diver and very enthusiastic. And she was able to put together a database. Uh, and as our, our, our data expanded, just because everyone's a citizen scientist now, everyone's got a camera. You get a picture of a manta ray and it's a it's a new one that no one's ever previously identified you get to name it you know and this we did that wet in jan like probably back in 2003 four i mean a long time ago uh we've been doing this for I, when as soon as we started 2000 i mean you were doing it even before mprf started so. oh yeah yeah i mean back in the 90s we were doing it uh but now we've got well, uh, it's like 300 berries that we've identified now as unique individuals in the big island uh, and so one of the first things we did at Nana Pacific, you know, like I said, research, education, conservation, uh, was we want to get manta rays protected in the state of Hawaii. So we, um, and I mean, I could, I could stretch this out to six hours, but uh, in a nutshell, it took us uh, from 2003 till 2009 with legislation going back over and over and over again until finally in 2009, we got Act 09209 uh, signed by the governor, make it easy oh, wow. in the state of Hawaii. So they protected with that, yeah. Uh, there's so many more things that we've done, but in a nutshell, that's that's the, the conservation, the beginning of the conservation, and there's a lot. So more. how far but out then, from Hawaii does that go? From Hawaii? Well, originally it was it was Hawaii because it was very few numbers, and then we added Maui because because uh, our friend Mark Dikos, who was also doing a PhD at University of Hawaii, had a big population of manatees over in Maui that he'd studied, and then we were adding ones from Oahu as well every now and again because they just don't see manatees that much in Oahu or Kauai. Um, but then just like the sheer numbers kind of started over, overwhelming us. And we're an all-volunteer organization. So we've scaled it back just to Hawaii. But we do have marks, I want to say, like maybe 200 from Maui. And I want to say we've probably got a handful from Oahu. Yeah. Um, and we so are they hunted it. that much? Pardon? Are they hunted that much? Uh, not in Hawaii. The native Hawaiians had no traditional fishery. In no, but elsewhere. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, in Asia, there's been a big demand for manta rays. Uh, the gill rakers, they cut them out, they uh, dry them, they grind them up, and they sell them in pills in Asia uh, to cleanse your blood, make parts of you bigger, things like that, you know, kind of the non, non-scientific. non There's a great movie about it called uh, Racing Extinction. If you haven't seen it, you gotta watch it. It's, yeah. uh, it's frightening, but it's just fabulous. And there's a whole bit in there about how Sean Heinrich, who took this picture behind me, uh, they went undercover and they uh, found out about the illegal animal trade and there's a huge long drama of, you know, animal trade and the illegal animal trade. And mm -hmm. so the manta rays are protected in many parts now. Uh, they've been added to the CITES, 
uh, which is Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species list, Appendix 2, which means you're not allowed to kill manta rays and trade them internationally without uh, discovering if, uh, what is a sustainable amount of trade. I believe Indonesia made their entire territorial waters a manta ray sanctuary. Uh, and Mary O'Malley published a great paper a while back uh, about how manta rays are worth a lot more alive, uh, something like a million dollars per manta ray over the course of its lifetime in ecotourism mm. versus if you kill the manta ray, it's worth about 500 bucks. And manta rays don't reproduce quickly. Uh, they have one pup per litter that takes maybe eight years to reach sexual maturity. The maturation, uh, pardon me, gestation period is about a year. They have wow. a pup every other year, so they don't reproduce quickly. Uh, from the research we've done here on the Big Island in Maui, comparing Mark's manta rays and our manta rays, it seems like, based on the DNA, that a uh, male manta ray will cross between Big Island of Hawaii and Maui, which is only 30 miles. But one male, they figure from the DNA uh, the divergence, it's maybe once every 150 years, and a female will cross between the two islands maybe every 1,500 years. So it's pretty much two distinctive populations here, just because water's so deep out there. Um, so they, they, they don't reproduce quickly and they don't migrate. So if you hunt for manta rays, they're gone pretty quickly. And Did you know how long they live for? Uh, well, that's a really good question, Ian. Um, I was uh, at an oceanography conference in Orlando about 10 years back. We were talking with the mm. gentleman that runs the Georgia Aquarium, and we had a bunch of manta ray nerds there. And he was talking about his manta rays. They've got an unbelievable program at the Georgia Aquarium with their megafauna, their manta rays, their whale sharks and stuff. And the manta ray that we'd known the longest was Lefty. As I mentioned earlier, she was really easy to identify. And we saw her regularly up until 2016. Uh, first time I ever met her was back in the 80s. The oldest photo of her was taken in, I think it was 1979. So she was, and she was already 40, probably 40 years old. Uh, Tim from Georgia Quinn said that they kind of thought that maybe Manta Rays lived maybe 20 years, but she was obviously a lot longer than that. So sometimes a long time, sometimes not at all, because they get tangled in fishing lines, they get hit by boats, and they get fished. Yeah. So mm -hmm. bad things can happen to good Manta Rays. But, but Lefty, Lefty was also a fully grown adult when she was first noticed yeah. in the first picture. So she was fully grown in 79 or something like that. She could have been born in 1970, you know. Incredible. <laughs> yeah, hey, Jeff, you come and see some them, yeah, yeah, no, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're just such amazing looking animals. Yeah. It just, it must be amazing. Do you remember your first time when you saw one? Me? Absolutely. It's in my log book. It was uh, August 1985. The whole family uh, it was my mom, dad, my two sisters, myself and Jeff. And we went out on the Blue Dolphin, uh, which is our little six pack boat. Drove down to the hotel down there. Uh, it's called the Sheraton Keahoe Resort now. But back then it was called the Kona Surf. And they built that hotel in 71. They shined lights into the water right in front of the at the bottom of the cliff, right by the, the restaurant and bar. And Jeff said, you know, we could go down there and kind of check and see if we can see some manta rays. I hear they're down there. And that's a really good Jeff imitation, right, Jan? I mean, <laughs> and, and this was back before it was Stingray a little, City. It was a little fast, actually. Yeah, I know. Uh, but this <laughs> was before Stingray City and all the other megafauna things. So we thought, yeah, sure. You know, I was in college. You know, let's do it. Uh, so we uh, go down there and we drop our anchor and we swim into the shallow water right in front of the hotel. It's about 15 feet deep and it's really illuminated from above uh, because of the hotel lights. And it's kind of surgy, you know, 15 feet of water. It's like a washing machine. But here are these giant manta rays swimming back and forth, right? And it's just unbelievable. And, you know, we watched it for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and we swam out and just did, you know, a dive. And I, I had maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 dives in my logbook at that time. But it was like lightning striking. It was just, oh, my gosh. And that was it. You know, I'm not going back to grad school. I'm going to go to Patty College and become a scuba instructor. And Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> the underwater calling. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. The call of the wild. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Janice? When did you first see a man manta? I was uh, um, living in California and did a uh, vacation to Kona. I went diving with uh, Jack's Diving Locker. One of the captains there took us down to the Kona Surf in Kaho. I believe it was Dave. Fink? We were diving. Fink, yeah. Yeah. Oh. On the blue dolphin, same with same yeah. as Keller. Um dropped us down into all of this swirling water. And um sat there. What you do is you sort of uh intentionally overweight a little bit 
Uh, so you're stuck to the bottom, hang on to a rock and um, shine your lights up in the water column. What that does is that attracts the plankton and then the manta rays are attracted to the plankton in the water. And um, so you just sit there hanging on with your lights and um, <laughs> the manta rays just come and they either adapt it or do it naturally, do barrel rolls in front of your lights. And so, oh. you know, they're coming straight at you, towards you, you know, you could reach up and touch them, but we don't um, kind of thing. And I just remember sitting there being tossed around in the water going, yeah, yeah, I like this. This is unbelievable. I, I like these creatures. And you get, um, you know, you hear a lot of people talking about um, having an encounter underwater. And with the Amanda's, it's uh, easy to see them in the eye, right? You, you, they're coming close to you. You look them in the eye and you know there's a, there's a being there. You have, uh, Are they curious with you? I don't know if I would just say that, maybe. Um, yeah, you could use a lot of different words, but I would, I don't know, maybe curious, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes they're just, they're just looking for a meal, right? Yeah. They need to feed, they need to get, uh, what, five times their body weight in plankton, which is, takes a lot of work. So they're, they're working um, really hard to get fed. So I think that's their, at night, oftentimes that's their main purpose is yeah. uh, just to be feeding so but anyway i have a picture somebody took a picture of me I'm trying to think of who it was you know with my uh with that's a classic tourist photo is get your picture taken with the manta ray underwater at night and uh i have my <laughs> wow <laughs> yeah. it looks like that I have, well it was trickier back then because same old thing it was film somebody oh. took uh god who was it Anyway, it has a picture of me, uh, you know, Manta Ray above me. And um, yeah, that was my uh, tourist photo. And I went, oh, that is pretty gosh darn cool. So how, what's the white or the biggest one you've ever seen? What kind of size are we talking about across? Uh, we've got two species. So there's the reef Manta Ray, which is what we consider uh, the Kona Manta Ray. Um, they're now, they were Manta Alfredi, now they're Mobula Alfredi, um, and they're smaller, and uh, I would say, what's the biggest one you've ever seen, Keller? Ten well, the books, feet? In the books it says 16 feet across, and for a long time we tried to figure a way to measure them, and then finally Dr. Eli Michael, uh, who's one of the board members of the Manta Pacific Research Foundation, uh, created a um, pair of lasers that sit on top of a video camera, and they shoot out two perfectly parallel laser beams, He's an astrophysicist with a mechanical engineering degree from Stanford, so he's very precise. Uh, and yeah. you got the video camera, so you get the picture of the manta ray's chest, so you know which manta ray it is, and then you get two green dots, and then you get the image. And he measured, I want to say it's like 14 of them, and the largest was Big Bertha, and she was 11.9 feet across. So what's that, three and a half meters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. he's gently full. Uh, then the manta borostris, uh, mobula borostris, as Jan said, the pelagic manta ray. Uh, they say they get uh, 20 feet across or so. Um, oh. They're pretty rare, but they're really big. We get both in Kona, though. So um, our uh, database consists of both Alfredi and Barostris. I just didn't think my kayak is about three meters long. So that's wider than what my kayak is long. Yeah, yeah. my paddleboard's 10 foot six. So, hey, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that really puts it into perspective, yeah. I'd like to see one of them. That's but they're really big, and they are completely harmless, right? They don't have any tail stingers, they don't have any sharp teeth, uh, they're curious. They've got the largest brain of any fish. Uh, one of our board members, Dr. Chilla Ari of the University of South Florida, uh, amazing woman, you guys should talk to her if you get a chance. She was born in Hungary, behind the Iron Curtain, and for some reason, her father had Jacques Cousteau behind the Iron Curtain. She grew up watching Jacques Cousteau. Yeah, I don't know if you know the story, Jan. And, um, I did, yeah. And, and so she uh, was all excited about meeting manta rays. And as soon as the iron curtain fell, she got English. She got to the other side. And we met her, Jan met her at, and Neil, I met her at the uh, American Alaska Branch Society meeting, which was in, was it Montreal that year? Yeah. And she had been studying manta rays' brains and their cognition. And she's published a couple of amazing uh, papers about manta ray's cognition uh, using a mirror. And does a manta ray recognize itself? Are they cognizant of themselves? Because some animals are, some animals, you know, they see the, the, another dog in the mirror. 
uh, great papers about that. Um, also about their dynamic coloration on their back. Uh, super interesting lady, and because um, she's Hungarian, she's got this amazing accent, and she always reminds me of Peter Lorre in one of the old movies. And she talks about the brain, oh, right. the brain, oh, and the brain. And she's actually, um, uh, we sent her down to Indonesia before um, CITES back in about 2012, and she was able to go into a fishing village. And if they know you're a conservationist, they want to you know, kill you. And if they know you're a researcher, they want to overcharge you. But she was able to, with the help of an Indonesian colleague, uh, barter for a manta ray brain. And uh, they were able to get it back to the University of South Florida. And they measured it and weighed it and scanned it. And it's the largest brain removed from any fish ever, anywhere. And, and it's kind of like a mystery. You know, why do these animals have such a big brain? And we kind of think that it might be because they have to be very smart in how they utilize their habitat as they move around their environment uh, they're not just dumbly wandering looking for food they're actually sensing where they are and moving from place to place also we think that the large brain may be part to help them with their social dynamic but they're just amazing creatures they swim by like jan said they're looking at you and you know they're looking at you right that's they're, amazing yeah, yeah. And yeah. If you don't them, they'll come right up to you they're curious you know they don't have what, was, what was her name i didn't catch it who chilla is yeah. her name C I S L L A. Uh, C S I L L A. Yeah. Oh, Ari. Uh, there was a great article about her in uh, uh, Dive, uh, Alert Diver magazine uh, last fall. Uh, I've always been interested in the data. Uh, Keller's been logging his dives. Obviously, we talked about that, but also logging the um, which mantis showed up where on what night and. Um, when they didn't show up that was always one of the big questions for many years is why were they there some nights and why were they not there other nights when yeah. you know we couldn't tell we don't have a definitive answer there was speculation that it was related to the lunar cycle but that was proven not to be true it's probably just related to food um so anyway i was always interested in um, the data and being able to use all that information that Keller was um, collecting. And then of course, there's um, other divers and other dive shops that are doing the dive um, as well. So, pre, you know, uh, well, I won't even say pre-COVID, but over time, there's a boat in the water at these particular sites seven days a week. And um, now it's actually a whole bunch of boats uh, at at least two and now even three sites. So there's there's certainly tour, has been tourist pressure and um, Keller is involved with figuring out how to fix that. But there's a ton of data. And so there's this sort of, um, there's the citizen scientist, but then there's this also middle ground. There's a large number of dive professionals working at these dive shops um, all along the coast. And they are gathering, um, like Keller, all the information. Um, because we've got the ID database, um, it used to be in a booklet, like printed. So the booklet was on the boats. And so people would come back up and try and figure out which one they seen. So um, we one of the things that's unique about Kona is that um, people can recognize the mantas without necessarily having a, a photo but they still know which manta it was and so i wanted to capture that information as well and then there's your sort of general public so that i would call that a very educated citizen scientist yeah and then there's also the tourists themselves and general citizen scientists who are yeah. Taking pictures and they're going out and um, collecting photos and sighting. It's a good thing for liverboards to get involved in, isn't it? Kona's again a bit different. There is one liveaboard which is very popular, and you know, Gresser liveaboard. But actually, uh, it's all shore-based diving in Kona. So people right. stay on the island and then go out for day trips, and that's the majority of uh, the divers in Kona. So it's. Um, it can go, you know, it's it's both. You know, there's only one liveaboard boat in Kona at this time. So at some point in time, after there, I was co we were collecting the data, um, and you know, I'm the technical person, and so we would have a forum on a website, 
and people would go and fill out the form on the website and say which mantas they saw on what particular night. But we didn't really have a good way to store that data if you want. It's sitting there in an email message and that's not all that useful, sitting in no. an email message. And so um, I wanted to um, put it in a database. Um, when I was looking at what the researchers were doing, collecting MANA information, it, um, it didn't really uh, help. Pretty much every researcher uses an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, if that's their technology of choice, and that is also not really a database. It, as a, a being in tech, you want to be able to query and know things, and you just don't get that from a spreadsheet. So I um, uh, went and um, spoke to uh, some other people, spoke to the Mark in um, Maui and another guy in, uh, guy in uh, the UK who runs the Manta Trust and uh, talked about doing um, what, what was needed for Manta stuff. And there, what they needed was actually what was different from what we needed in Kona. It, it, it really um, didn't apply. So I tried to um, incorporate what we needed in Kona with everything else and created a, a database that could um, work for anything, including Kona. And then um, because I write apps, um, I did an app <laughs> and uh, did the uh, it's it's available in, uh, yeah, that's a sort of a longer discussion, but um, you know, it's a native app for iOS. I do Mac and iOS application yeah. development, so that's no. what I did and um, created uh, started initially, um, wanted to get the data in the database because that's. Uh, the hardest part. We have all of this history back to Keller says 1991 essentially, but it's not in a usable format. So I wanted to start as soon as possible getting it into a usable format and getting the data available to do something interesting with. Yeah. And, you know, I'm still working on that. So I did the app. It was released maybe 2016. I can't remember um, around then. And I, you know, an app is an ongoing thing. So I keep working on it. And then I also um, keep entering, you know, the data, Keller enters data. And then there's um, other uh, dive masters and professionals um, submitting their information, which man is they see, and I make sure that gets in the database as well. No, right now it's only available on Apple iPhone, because I write Apple iPhone apps. Um, I would love to have a Android version, I uh, because it's all volunteer. Um, I need someone to work for free, which is hard to find. <laughs> and um, and maybe recently, we can ask out for you. Sure. Uh, yeah, if somebody would be willing to write an Android app, um, it's on my list of things to do. I could do it, but since I sort of have to learn and do at the same time, I have not yet. Um, I uh, also the same applies to a web page. So the app is now the, half the app is available on a web page. That's their R I D page. It now looks up all the information in the database as well. It do used to be static. Do you find though, um, you know, you do get people say to you, you know, they're very good with certain programs and uh, certain platforms, and then sometimes easier to do it yourself and learn how to do it and learn how to do it and just crack on with it yourself do, do you find that well since no one has actually offered to do it badly yet <laughs> 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 no <laughs> not yet um uh, but you know that might happen um in the end i have to be responsible you know apps are not a uh one thing i do know from being in tech is applications are not a one-off thing you don't just sort of write it once and then the person goes away somebody has to take ownership so since i'm going to be the owner um i get a pretty large say in how it works and and since i have to keep it up because that's a you know it it takes upkeep always um apple is um 
notorious for changing things. And so uh, as an app developer, I have to keep up and, and make it work on the latest this and the latest that. And the same would be yeah. true with Android as well and websites. So, you know, I had someone who was looking, uh, uh, I had someone else help me slash do uh, the website version. And, um, but I need to keep it up. It's not going to be their responsibility. So what is your recommendation for people who are going to be listening to you guys to, uh, for the first time? You know, when we get this out and put this out there, what's your advice for them to, you know, if they are thinking about, you know, following somebody or, uh, sorry, following one of the man arrays, what's the best way of doing it? Does it go to this, go to your app? Yeah, definitely. They can download the iOS app or they can go to the ID website, uh, find, look at one of the particular man arrays. Um, and then on the website, you can click the link that says, uh, look at latest sightings. So you would see the latest and greatest last time that man array was seen, um, and by whom and where. So, um, that information's available. The person who first identifies uh, Manta Ray gets to pick the name. So I just added two new uh, uh, Barostras, not the Alfredi, uh, yesterday. And so the person that uh, photographed them and identified them first got to pick the name. I thought something how we could get some more attention to you guys as well is that we could put something on our website for the, the Manta Ray that's called the Big Scuba. We put that on our website and anyone can track it as well. And or we have a link, go to your website. And we could do a competition to uh, for the next Manta Ray scene that hasn't got a name. People can suggest names to it. Just an idea. It's an excellent idea. People are very eager to name Manta Rays. You know, I mean, I've named them for all my kids, my wife, you know, my, my <laughs> in-laws, um, everything you can think of. So there's one named Sugar Ray, there's Stevie Ray, there's X-Ray, there's Darth Raider. There's, I mean, three named one, Stephen Colbert, um, uh, all these crazy names. Uh, and it, it's interesting because since COVID started, we've actually added, I mean, gee, we probably added five man rays since COVID started. I mean, a couple of mm -hmm. we got Yeah, the new babies are showed up in, in force. I was really surprised. Yeah, and one of the first ones, my friend Emily named one. Um, she's one of the boat captains and instructors, an avid manta ray person. And Emily was out just free diving in Kailua Bay one day, and she saw this little baby female. You know, and she, she got a picture of it, great ID shot, and she goes up, it's a new one. So she named her Quarantina. <laughs> I love that. I, love I like that. it. It's cool. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I named one Cousteau. So, I mean, if, if Ian, we'd have to find somebody whose name got a new manta ray. Yeah, and doesn't already have a name for it, yeah. you know, and it, it's a, most people are really jealously guarding the opportunity to name a manta ray. Yeah, I bet, I bet, I bet. I was ready. I thought I'd ask the question. Name name when, Gemma. I thought I'd ask the question and see if there is one. Yeah, big scuba one, and then we can put put it on the website. Where's big scuba today? You know. Yeah, because obviously we want to give, you know, our guests, you know, more exposure and attention to, you know, from around the world, our listeners as well. So, yeah, if we can do that for you, that would be fab. Oh, that'd be yeah. great. I, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to you guys anytime. I've got hours and hours of <laughs> and stories. And you guys ever see the video online where the dolphin swims up to me on a manta ray night dive? Really? Yeah, it's awesome, that is. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. So you, you know, you bet into it and that responded. Yeah. And you, you was, tried that again. Um, well, it, it's amazing because I've taken manta ray, uh, fishing lines off of manta rays many times, turtles and stuff like that. But when that dolphin swam by that first time, uh, it hit us with a super loud blast of sonar, right? Whoa. And I look back and there's a bottle of those dolphins swimming around, right? And those are big animals. And it swam all the way around the earth. I don't know, maybe 70 divers in the water at the time. And the second time it swam by, I noticed the fishing line hanging out of its mouth. And it was swimming by, kind of showing that side of its body to people. But I, in, in the video, if you watch the one that I edited, you see me, I'm holding the camera, and I go, hey, come here. And in the corner, you see my finger go like this, and it swam right up to me. And then there's another lady there who's shooting video, and she starts rolling. I just dropped my camera. 
and it wouldn't leave me alone. And I was able to cut the fishing line off and everything, went up, got air, came back down, uh, and it swam off. And prior to that, I thought all dolphins looked alike, but we noticed it's got a little white mark behind its eye, mm -hmm. uh, really just think of white smokar there. And uh, it's, we've seen it since. And looking at video that I shot the previous summer when we had been out in the water, and my son, who was uh, going between junior and senior year in high school at that time, he and some of his friends got in the water, and I got some really cool shots of them with the dolphins, and they got to use them in their senior year yearbook. So I rescued the dolphin, and we get the senior year book, yearbook, and we open it up, and there's a picture of my son swimming with the same dolphin that I'd later rescued. Oh, wow. It's like, yeah. So it, it's amazing. Just unbelievable. And we've taken all kinds of fishing lines off of manta rays, you know, I mean, plucked uh, marine leeches off manta rays sometimes. I mean, it's crazy stuff, crazy yeah. stuff. Yeah, amazing. It's I got a question for you guys. Do you know why mermaids wear seashells? <laughs> Still my favorite. <laughs> I know. Ian, you're no. done. We expect this. You don't know this. No. Mermaids wear seashells because B shells are too small and D shells are too big. <laughs> I like that. That's cool. <laughs> I should try that. Yeah. yeah. So what does the future hold for your mantas and the project? One of the huge challenges that we were facing prior to COVID-19 was the, the huge demand on the resource, the number of divers and snorkelers and boats and operators. And we've been trying to, you know, one of the first things we did was back in 1993, the local dive shops got together and um, we wrote the guidelines for manta ray night dive, how to res respectfully, you know, participants can go out and dive with manta rays. You know, it's don't touch the manta rays, stay out of the water column, keep your cameras down, stay together, watch, harm, don't harm the environment, that sort of stuff. And then with the help of, back then, it was brand new, it was called Patty Project Aware back then, and of course Project Aware is huge now. They distributed the guidelines to all the dive shops in town. Uh, one of the great things about scuba shops, whether you're BSAC, Maui Patty, SSI, whatever, they all have sort of the same ethos about education, mm -hmm. conservation, safety, sustainability. Um, in about 2010, we started getting a lot of snorkel operators coming out. People realized that the state of Hawaii, unfortunately, has uh, no, uh, no requirements for people to take people snorkeling. So everyone with a boat can take people snorkeling. And so also we have this explosion of snorkel operators coming out there. And... They'd come out, drop their anchor, they're putting people in the water that don't know how to swim. Um, they're doing all kinds of really crazy, dangerous, in my opinion, unsustainable uh, practices. Uh, and there was some conflict between the dive operators and snorkel operators. So the Coast Guard got everyone together and they said, you guys got to come up with a plan on how to do this. Because if somebody gets killed, there's going to be problems. So since 2012, we've been working with the local dive operators and snorkel operators. We wrote a great document um, about how to run a manta ray charter you know some of it's like my you know unbelievably simple like you should have oxygen on board the boat you should have aed your crew should be trained as lifeguards you, you think you don't have to tell people that but yeah. if it's not required most operators will go to you know the lowest the lowest bar so uh, other things a little more nuanced like if your two boats are tied together right because there's a limited number of moorings um the two boats are like this make sure that the rope between them floats because if it's a negatively buoyant line, it droops down. We've had manta rays run into them, and it harms the manta rays, it harms the boats. So we got those uh, guidelines, uh, the, the tour standards, out to all the commercial operators, but they were voluntary. So uh, some people did it, most didn't. Uh, uh, my wife uh, wrote, uh, we taught a class through Hawaii Community College called Manta, uh, manta Naturalist for Tour Operators and Tour Guides, because so many people were getting hired that didn't know anything about manta rays. I mean, they're not even... Some of them were even scuba divers, and they're the tour guide, and they're supposed to give a briefing. So we yeah. want to do, we want to teach the teachers. We want to make it where we can help the, the people who are taking the guests out, give them the best possible uh, experience. Uh, a couple of guys, uh, Brian and Mark, uh, two professors, one from University of Hawaii, one from Oregon State, did a great survey some years back where they surveyed like 600 people, I believe it was, who had done a man ray dive and snorkel uh, about their experience. And apparently it's a common survey that they do with, at, you know, at historic sites and museums and parks and things. And their conclusion was that we need more education of the tourists, the, the people that are consuming. So we tried to do that. Um, it's not required so people don't sign up for it. So we're trying to get the teachers taught. We've been working with the state to try to come up with some sort of certification program. 
if you're going to be taking people out on snorkel trips, it's almost a no-brainer, right? Ian, you're a dive master. You know what goes into becoming a rescue diver and being able yeah. to supervise Hot. people taking in the water. Um, we, we'd like the state to require that if you're putting people in the water to snorkel, you got to have a crew on board that's trained as a lifeguard. State's resisting. We've been working on that since like literally 2012. Since COVID, you know, most people are out of business, but we're seeing the industry slowly come back. And I was out there the other night. And one of the good things is uh, that we found that rather than taking people circling, you, you just take a surfboard with a bunch of handholds on it. And rather than trying to give people a flashlight to hold, you just mount the torches on the surfboard. That way the guide can tow the people around. And mm -hmm. if somebody does get panicky or something, you can climb up on the surfboard. Um, yeah. And we literally have people coming out that don't know how to swim. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Gemma's like, well, wow. uh, which is almost counterintuitive, but the, the great thing about it, I think, is that people that don't know how to swim come out and see these manta rays, and like me, they get struck by the bolt of lightning, and all of a sudden they're like, I'm going to learn to swim, I'm going to learn to snorkel, I'm going to learn to dive, I'm going to you know, embrace uh, marine life. I think Cousteau said, people protect what they love, and if we can get people to get out here and fall in love with manta rays in the ocean, they'll hopefully protect it. So yeah. it's a work in progress. You know, We're just going to keep plugging away, keep teaching, keep enjoying the mantra race you know jan has done such a great job taking my stupid paper logbook and my scuba pro page logbook putting it into the database then we have the mantra ray email list now we have a manta facebook group and now she's got the the 21st cut edge cutting uh, century 21st century cutting edge technology that's easy for me to say uh at, in, at work so we're just gonna keep plugging away keep plugging away share the love and do share with us as well, because, you know, we're, we're very active on social media. Um, so we're happy to share around as well anything that you want as you know, all helps. If there's anything that we can do to, you know, pass the message on as well, you know, do send anything over to us. Well, if you guys want to, uh, uh, I'll talk to you after this. I'll pop you an email after this, because uh, if you want to share the information that we put out there every day, I think that might be a good thing. So your people yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, definitely. There, there's multiple layers, right? When I go out on a Manta dive, Jan knows this, I log it in my logbook, right? Which Manta rays I saw, anything significant. Uh, then I do a, um, an email to Manta ID, uh, no, Manta report at mantapacific.org. And it's just what I saw. And then I add that to the uh, Facebook group for the Manta ray tour guides. And mm -hmm. then I go and I do the app entry on uh, Jan's app so there's like multiple layers um, and it, you know it, it's a neat story and it's, sometimes it's kind of dry sometimes it's a little more animated it depends. Well, well, and one one of the things I would just add to what Keller's talking about is um, there because the uh, number of uh, operators going out every every day has uh, increased there is a question the one of the big questions is is the number of boats and the number of divers is that impacting the manta rays are there less manta rays than there used to be and you know you can't you can't answer that question without data so one mm -hmm. of the things the app tracks is you know the number of boats the number of divers number of snorkelers and um if we can get the his we're working now on getting the historical data back to 1991 with that kind of information in it as well you can analyze over time, you know, boats have gone up by this much, but the number of man rays has gone up by that much or gone down by that much. So um, in order to answer those questions, you need data. But are they going up or is that they're just being sighted, do you think? Because you've got more people in the water. <laughs> Don't know. Also, how many they... entries have you got? How many mantas have been entered into the database? So, uh, as Kelly said, we're at like about 300 now, but some of those are the barostrus, and those are, those are, pardon the expression, those are a completely different beast. Right. For the Alfredi, um, I just looked it up, and it's, we have 150 female, 119 male, and 235 total, which is oh. actually um, not that many. Um, we've referenced this guy, uh, Mark, in Maui, and um, he figures there's maybe about uh, 105 uh, breeding adults. So you're depend and and we're not getting influx, and they're probably not uh, leaving. They may be getting killed. But it with the low rate of reproduction, uh, 105 breeding adults is not very many. So um, mm -hmm. you know that. It's important to keep track of what's going on. It's incredible. Do you ever put like trackers on or anything like that? 
Uh, our, uh, uh, so as Keller did the the uh, origin story of Man of Pacific Research, she referenced Tim, who did his PhD, and he did um, uh, active tracking and passive tracking. So he had a boat um, and some volunteers, and he put active trackers, pingers, audio sort of yeah. audio pingers on maybe five mantas and and track them and um saw they didn't uh, go too far and then he did passive tracking which means he had receivers in the water in various locations yeah. and um when the manta went by it pinged and and uh recognized that that particular manta and that's included in his phd which is yeah. uh he did his dissertation it's available because some of the things that you've dis dis discussed, when I get my words out, um, and some of the issues that you're facing are very similar to what we've heard from the Galapagos skies when they've talked about the whale sharks. Because, you know, increase of tourism and uh, in the area, and they're obviously worried about how that affects the, um, the mating rituals of the whale sharks. And, also, and there's a big part of that where they don't know where they go to and they only know certain parts and there's still big pieces of the jigsaws that they don't actually know but but their worry is as well as they're trying to um you don't want to put people off but you want but it's using people and using tourism in the right way and making it making sure it's sustainable all the things that you're talking about as well they're facing yeah. a similar thing as well. Do you ever sort of compare notes across and talk to other sort of groups? Uh, we, uh, I, I, I've, I've talked with guys from the Galapagos before. Uh, back in 2016, they had the uh, International Union on the Conservation of Nature in Honolulu. It was the first time they ever had it in the U.S. And I went over there uh, for one day. Uh, it's, it's actually where Obama announced the Papa, Hunoa, Papa Mukea Ahua. I, I stepped on it, didn't I? Papa Hanaukua Kea, I got it. Papa Hanaukua. I'm glad you said it. Now, oh, yeah, yeah, I know. It's a mouthful, but it's uh, the whole Northwest Hawaiian Island chain is a sanctuary. Uh, but I went to a meeting there. It was called Wet and Wild, and it was put on by NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, about sustainable ecotourism. And we all met, and people from all over the world, and just talked about what works, what doesn't work. I uh, had an opportunity to talk about a, a, a sustainable framework and it exists. NOAA has it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just a matter of implementing it. And as I said, there are some encumbrances that we've run into with the state of Hawaii. Uh, so that's a work in progress. You know, um, uh, Jan mentioned Tim's tagging and tracking, you know, uh, when he first tagged Lefty, she swam from the dive site down about six miles south, six miles back. So she swam 12 miles between the time the divers left and the divers got back. And we used to think, I used to think, if we're seeing the same manta ray every day, every night, that they're hanging out there. Uh, he tagged another manta ray uh, named Big Bertha, and she swam north. He called me the next morning, because we'd have to resupply his boat at sea. It was, the boat was awful. You know, we bring him like diesel and, and oil, because it's burning oil and like food. And um, he said she'd swim 25 miles north. And then uh, we said, okay, well, we'll see you later. Good luck. You know, and that day she was right back. So she swam 50 miles between the time the divers left wow. and got back. As I mentioned previously, uh, it's only 30 miles between the Big Island and Maui. And yet none of our Manta Alfredi have ever been documented crossing between it, right? So Tim's, one of his conclusions is it was a closed uh, uh, population. population. Yeah. Uh, Mark Dikos did the same thing using uh, uh, DNA. Now, Mark just did a great talk during COVID, uh, uh, NOAA talk about manta rays and uh he said that in some of the places in the world they've tagged and tracked manta alfredi where they will swim like 300 miles and we talked recently and he was saying but that water that they're swimming is probably shallow you know moderately shallow uh mm -hmm. the big island of hawaii if you go five miles offshore the water is literally a mile deep uh the water between the big island and maui it's like eight thousand feet deep so we figure that they kind of like being in closer shallower water so right. they're a closed population. And so in terms of tagging, people say, why don't you tag them? There might not be very much data that we would get from tagging Manta Alfredi mm -hmm. just because they're within five miles of the shore. Um, tagging Manta Barossers was super interesting, right? Because those guys swim all over the place. I mean, they had Manta Barossers in Orange County, California a few years ago. Um, you know, when you're 20-foot Manta, where do you swim? Yeah. Anywhere you want. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a lot to be done, you guys.
It's weird that they don't cross between the two islands. It's 8,000 feet deep out there. And I mean, it's the big blue, you know? And like Mark's study of the DNA says that, you know, once every 150 years, or once every 1,500 years, they may, but who knows, is that a, a rogue mantra, like Jonathan Livingston Seagull just doing stuff that you're not supposed to do? I don't know. Yeah, it's he's funny, though. He, so I was I just going to say his uh, genetics showed that at some point in time, maybe one male manta came from Kona and went to Maui, but otherwise they are completely separate genetic populations. Yeah. And, and, and if you look at any of the data, you can see that they easily swim in terms of distance. 30 miles is nothing. They swim more than that every day. So there's a reason they're not going back and forth. Mark and I were uh, hoping to get an opportunity to go out and get more DNA. He's got DNA from a, a number of manatees, maybe 20 or so over in Maui, and maybe only like 10 over here. I'm not sure the exact numbers, but we're hoping if we could get more DNA, then we could get more refined numbers. Uh, Mark's a hardcore scientist, right? He's a PhD. I'm just a scuba instructor. Uh, I think if we were able to get some more DNA here, we could kind of plot who's related to who, because it's a small family, you know? Uh, who's a really good, uh, really successful at reproducing uh, who is yeah. not you know because uh, people say is that the baby it's like, oh, someone's baby i don't know who <laughs> actually but, mark said he got 20 samples from kona did he okay because that was 20 from mark. maui and 20 from kona i don't know where he got them but yeah no i know he was going for that and and he wanted to do that and that i think was the threshold number where he could start running the dna but we'd like to get more yeah it's amazing. It's like building a family tree, isn't it? Yeah. That's if we if we had the samples, we could do it easily. And that's what I thought. I mean, I'm all about. Oh, they're so cute, right? Oh, who? There's a baby mantra and grandma, and uh, yeah, that's what I want to find <laughs> out. <laughs> well, well, and also you see spot patterns that are so similar. I always wonder: are the spot patterns that are similar? Does that mean they're related? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's incredible, and you know, I think there's probably a lot of people in the UK that have no idea about mantas and you know this will just open their eyes completely. I'm just thinking about is there any other fish or animals out there which follow those kind of characteristics because we look similar don't we with our genes <laughs> you know yeah. our, our you know our children you know resemble what the parents don't they often or grandparents well, you know, about animals that's interesting, you know, that might be an analogous uh, uh, to humpback whales, right? Because the humpback whales are actually born here in Hawaii. They migrate up to Alaska every year. Uh, they, they feed up there every summer, then they come back to Hawaii and mate and birth here. And I know they identify humpback whales by the, the colors on their flukes, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. And I would suspect that those guys who studied them must have DNA. I mean, I wonder if those, those match. There you go, you're gonna have to ask the question. Ask the question, somebody will try to find an answer. Yeah, it's a way to learn. <laughs> I love this sort of stuff, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah it's, it's so much the unknown, and you think there's so much unknown about the underwater world, and it's just, yeah, you're just probably tipping, yeah, it's the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? The well, more Gemma, you know, the more you know you don't know. Sorry? I want to find out how Gemma's checkout dives go. Oh, yeah, we'll keep posted, just watch social yeah. media. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so if, uh, is it, for everywhere, for people who want to follow you, best place to go is either the website, the app. If they're not on, if they're not on uh, iPhone, the best to go to the website, yeah? Yep, you can find all the information on the website. And then we also do, uh, do a little bit, not great, of um, Instagram, Twitter. Yeah. And uh, there's a man of Pacific. Gemma's um, Instagram queen. <laughs> yeah, if you uh, need to share anything, just let, just ping me, and then we'll get it out to all our followers. So. I um I usually do a post on each one of the new mantas that come, so I actually need to do that with the uh, latest two Barastras, and then um, but that's about it. I don't do too much else. Just keep busy with the app. You know, limited time limited yeah. resources so uh, uh obviously my focus is the app can i just yeah. ask because i'm an android user so obviously i saw that you can't download the app but can you get something on a website to track these managers so is that on yeah, your, yeah. your 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 standard website can you get the link yes yeah 
Okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So then you just get the whole list of uh, mantas and then you can um, filter by whether Barastra, Selfredi, and Sex, or look for a particular name. And then when you go to the, the sort of detailed page, you see all the photos we have of that manta. And um, then there's a button that says show recent um, sightings. So you don't see all of them, but you see recent sightings. And I, I meant to say one of the things I want to do with the app is collect photos. would love to get, you know, um, a ton of photos of each one of the mantas because the goal is actually to be able to do some artificial intelligence and machine learning so that users can submit their own photos and then have the app figure out which mantle they saw. I, and I forgot to, one of the reasons that it's a, an app, not just a web page, is that you can actually um, use the app while you're not connected to the internet so that you can keep track of your sightings and add all of the uh, information. You would then just, keep, you know, it would stay on your phone until you got back to the internet and then you could submit the sightings afterwards but you can use the app while you're not connected well thank you very much thank, you, thank you for your time oh it was just fantastic to join you guys and happy to share the the manta love and, and thanks for including us and let let us know if we can do anything else to help the big scuba podcast we'll do super it. yeah all right. uh, thank you all right thanks, all right thanks janice thanks Kelly. have a great weekend okay thank you. You too Bye. thanks a lot good luck this weekend Gemma. Thank you very Stay much. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Well, welcome back. What do you think to that, Angela? Well, I think it was just so, it's great to have two people on the podcast and such enthusiastic people. Just, yeah, completely caught up in the Manta project. Yeah, loved it. And, um, I look forward to uh, getting them back uh, some stage really uh, to get an update is um, you know two two people who uh, are totally who are totally you know enthusiastic and motivated by you know these manners and uh, it kind of does rub off on them. Yeah. And, uh, you know it's amazing amazing animals you know and there's so many of them and um, you know it's just a beautiful animal to watch and watch so graceful so uh, it's brilliant what they do and if you get a chance do look up their website uh, look up the mantapacific.org and they do have the app so don't forget the app and that's available at the apple app store so yeah it's not on the android but you can go on the website and see pictures of mantas they have identified and named and their locations and all their marking yeah and we did have a little a little cheeky chat to see whether we can get a big scuba manta. Yes, so, so uh, watch could, this space. It'd be really great to, if we can get one of the mantas uh, named after the old podcast there. So we we'll give us a little stuff on there to track and see where it is and see what's up to it. Cheer it on on its merry <laughs> way. Go, there it goes. Yeah, <laughs> because these mantas in Hawaii don't seem to travel a great deal or mix a great deal. So it'd be great to have one named after us that we can watch. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. We can give little updates and see where it is. Uh, so that'd be great. And talking about traveling, um, we are on the travels. We are, we are. on the road uh, very shortly in the next few days, aren't we? Yes, we're heading north. Heading north. So watch out, uh, Bonnie, Scotland. We're coming nearby. Um, <laughs> we won't be, I don't think it's actually on this uh, crossing to Scotland, but I think we are just right near the uh, the border, the border. So we're going to do some yeah. acts, um, which has also been in the Avengers film as well, isn't it? So it's a famous little spot. I didn't know uh, that. So, yeah, yeah, it's just north of uh, Berwick Pondry, uh, which is you know a really beautiful part of the country. Mm. And always getting up there, I've not dived up there. Um, and there's lots of uh, pretty things to go see because there's the very famous cathedral dive through there. Um, so look forward to that. That's all new dive sites that I haven't explored yet. So yeah. uh, I think the seals up there, also very similar to the farms. Um, you know, so uh, just going to be really nice. Get up there, and we are doing some product reviews. We've got the new um, Shearwater Peregrine, and uh, that we'll be testing. We've mm -hmm. got the Paralins. 
that was going to be uh, side of the head and side of your head. I think uh, it's only fair that we uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll give that it a go. Over the parallels, um, and then using that as well on some other dive and other trips. We're yep. taking uh, paddle boards as well, just in case we do get pushed out of the weather. Yeah, so we'll be on, on or in or under the water, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And also doing updates as well while we're up there. So, um, you know, look out for that. That will all be on the usual Facebook, FaceTube and whatever. Be on there. Look out for FaceTube. <laughs> You no, know, social media, where it all happens, where it all is. <laughs> yes, and right, so, yeah, so, um, and also coming up um, after that will be Gemma. We'll be interviewing Ranva from Fourth Element. So that will be quite timely because I'll be fully trying out my Fourth Element dry suit in St. Abs. So yeah. that would be three days of sea diving with fourth element dry suit, uh, gloves, hood. Yeah, the hydra suit. Yeah, so that will be all quite nicely linked in. Yeah, and I've got my dry suit back from 03. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for your help in getting that fixed. Uh, so thankfully, I was getting a wet bum, so I had to get that, get that <laughs> fixed. Don't know why I was getting a wet bum, but there you go. But anyway, they, 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 they tell me it's all fixed. So, uh, hi, Tom. Thank you very yeah. much. And we're going to have some O3 hoods and gloves to try out. Oh, yes. Yep. yes. And also, yep. we've got Mares PCV and regulators also. So and you've got the Mares uh, dive computer. Dive well. computer as well. Yeah. So it's going to be a busy few days. We've got it quite is. a few reviews. There's going to be not a lot of spare time. So there's going to be quite a lot of to to be done and get on the social media so yeah they'll all be going on and um probably once we get back as well so i'd be surprised we get all that done in through a very short period we've got time. three days <laughs> so three days two dives or maybe shore dives as well yeah that should be fun, be um, fun look forward to that, really. yeah yeah i haven't had a um uh trip like that for quite a while well not since the farms last year so uh, mm. it's gonna be good look to that so really, I think that's kind of about the, us done for this episode, I do believe. Just remind people to look at the YouTube channel, The Big Scuba, where all the podcasts are now on a audio book. Yeah, they are. And our older episodes, we'll be putting them on as well over the course of the coming weeks. It's all a matter of time, so we can't do it all. But um, yeah, they'll be going on. Um, watch out for the little spaceman. Oh! <laughs> Where did that come from? I didn't mean I to take that. What's this space? Watch that space. Watch that space. <laughs> yes, watch that space. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. So uh, if you've got any questions, if you've got to contact the show, you know where to come to. Uh, send the email in. There's actually a competition. Um, if you want to take part, uh, it's free to do so. You can you can join in via the website, bigscuba.com, or any of our social media. Just send us a line, and the line is... I want to go diving with Miranda Krestovnikov because... And uh, Miranda's kindly offered uh, to judge the winning answers. So uh, let's hear it, let's have them, write in, email in, and, um, and let's the prize, see who wins. The prize is a fourth element storm poncho. It is, yeah. yeah. So uh, it's, uh, it's red, isn't it? Burgundy. Dark red, then. <laughs> <laughs> I have oh, I've, I've modelled, modelled it on the beach, so check out our social media. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's on the old uh, website, so it's all out. Anyway, yeah. so uh, I think that is actually it. We've done the competition, we've done who's coming up next, uh, so look out for Ranva. Uh, that's a really good one. And you'll be hearing more of us as um, over the course of the next few days with our trip. In St Abs, so keep an eye on Facebook and Instagram for posts and stories. And we'll do our best to answer any questions or questions. Yeah. All right then, well, that's it for me. That's me till next episode. Which will be episode 30. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Thanks for tuning in uh, once more, listening to us, rabbiting on. And uh, we'll leave it there. So thank you very much. And we'll speak to you next time. Okay, bye everyone. Bye. Bye too.